How's everybody doing? <laughs> it's a supreme pleasure to be with you all today. Today I'm going to be talking about building tech ecosystems. But before I begin, I just wanted to ask the audience, just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever visited the San Francisco Bay Area or Silicon Valley, as one may call it? Okay, so we've got a couple of people in the audience. It's a pretty amazing place, isn't it? And some of you may recognize this picture. This is University Ave, downtown Palo Alto. But it's also kind of startling to think that this is what Palo Alto looked like less than 100 years ago. And so the question is, why? Why is it that all of the big tech companies decided to set up shop in this obscure place in central California? What were the key elements that made the Santa Clara Valley the Silicon Valley? Well, let's talk about a little bit of history first. This is Stanford University. Leland Stanford founded Stanford University in 1885. He was a railroad baron. Then in 1909, David Starr Jordan, he was the president at Stanford at the time, invested in the Audion Tube. He invested $500 into this piece of technology, $16,000 US in today's money. And this was considered one of the very first high-tech investments, arguably one of the first venture capital investments ever made. And this spawned a culture of entrepreneurship. Several decades later, William Shockley invented the silicon transistor. He won the Nobel Prize for this. And in 1956, he left Bell Labs in New Jersey and went to Mountain View, California, where he started Shockley Semiconductor Laboratories. He brought his entire team with him, but unfortunately, his paranoid and neurotic management style drove his team out in 1957. These eight gentlemen became known as the Traitorous Eight, they started Fairchild Semiconductor in 1957. And about a month after opening their doors, the USSR launched Sputnik, and the space race was on. In 1961, John F. Kennedy announced that the US was going to put a man on the moon. And in order to do so, they had to figure out how to take an astronomical amount of computing power and squeeze it into this tiny little box aboard the lunar module. Luckily for NASA, Robert Noyce, just a couple years earlier, invented, invented the planar integrated circuit made from silicon. And this is quite literally what blasted the entire Silicon Valley to the moon. At a Fairchild Semiconductor, many employees and founders left to found companies such as Intel, SanDisk, and AMD. And the venture capital funds Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins also came out of Fairchild Semiconductor. All of a sudden, we have ourselves a budding ecosystem. In addition to that, the total population of those who live in Silicon Valley is just under 40%, so almost half, whereas the national average for the United States is less than 15%. So returning back to my previous question, what are those elements that you need to start an ecosystem? Well, you need this culture of entrepreneurship. You need a high density of highly skilled workers. You need a lot of public capital to catalyze the reaction. You need a lot of investments into high-tech areas. And finally, immigration. Now, to really drive my point home here, I want to talk about Israel. So here's a country that's basically an island. Except being surrounded by water, you're surrounded by a bunch of countries that are trying to wipe you off the face of the Earth. So the Israelis had to get creative with how they were going to defend themselves. They also had to think fast and act like a startup. So when the Israelis organized their military, they organized it such that it had a horizontal structure and not a vertical structure like almost every other military in the entire world. What this did was this fostered a culture of entrepreneurship, so much so that today, for every 1,844 citizens in Israel, there's one startup. So we have our culture of entrepreneurship. Next up, for every 10,000 employees there are in Israel, there's roughly 140 scientists and 135 engineers, the most out of any developed society in the entire world. So we have our high density of highly skilled workers. Next up, in 1993, Israel launched something called the Yasma Group, Yasma, which stands for initiative. Yasma 
was responsible for funding its first generation of venture capitalists in the country. They provided 40% of the total capitalization of a fund. And this was in the form of a refundable grant. So the investors realized a lot of leverage. Now this chart, I want you to just take a mental note of this chart. We're going to use it later. But beginning in 1993, Yasma started deploying funds to its VC ecosystem. And as you can see, it went up and to the right. And it sustained itself even after the dot-com bust. So we have our public capital to catalyze a reaction. Next up, in 1974, Intel was looking to create its second headquarters, and it decided to pick Israel. It was instrumental in developing its generation of mobility chips. These mobility chips, to this day, make up half of Intel's revenue. Intel has since invested $10 billion in the country, actually more than $10 billion since 1974. Then in 1998, Cisco decided to build its second headquarters in Israel. It was responsible for the development of the CRS-1 web router. This is a very high piece of technology that lives in many data centers. And Cisco has since invested $2 billion since 1998, and so we have our large investments into high-tech areas. Finally, in 1990, after the fall of the Soviet Union, roughly 800,000 Jews emigrated from the Soviet Union, or the former Soviet Union, back to Israel. One in three of these individuals had some sort of formal technical training. They were either a scientist or an engineer. So we have our immigration story. But on the other hand, we have a place like Dubai. So Dubai arguably has a phenomenal culture of entrepreneurship. It has one of the highest immigration rates out of any developed country in the entire world. And there's lots of public capital flowing into its ecosystem. But it's missing two very important things. It's missing a high density of highly skilled workers. And because of that, companies aren't creating centers of innovation in Dubai. Sure, large tech companies have presences in Dubai, but these are service centers. These aren't centers of innovation. So if you don't have all five of these elements, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a tech ecosystem. So this is very important. So the question is, is what about Poland? What's the story here? Well, ironically, Poland's culture of entrepreneurship stems from the many decades behind the Iron Curtain. Because of a centrally planned economy and state enterprises, this created economies of shortages in the country. Long lines like this were not uncommon in those days. And I'm sure many of you sitting in this audience have stories from parents or grandparents or other family members about these days. Here's an article from the New York Times, 1975, Black Markets Bloom in Eastern Europe Behind Facade of Straight-Laced Marxism. If you had an old pair of blue jeans, and if you were in Warsaw, you can get up to $70 for that old pair of blue jeans. That just gives you an idea of this black market. And then this man, Jerzy Kochanowski, wrote a book about all of these anecdotes, because there were just so many. It's estimated that anywhere between 20 to $30 billion annually was the size of the Polish black market during that time. So we have our culture of entrepreneurship. Next up, we're going to talk about the highly skilled workers here in the country, and what better place to start than looking at STEM graduates. So this is a period between 2013 and 2019, so a seven-year period. Poland produced 761,000 STEM graduates in that period, so number four in Europe, even though it's number six in terms of population. So this high number isn't simply a function of the population of the country, but rather it's a function of the STEM graduates per capita. Now, Poland is number nine overall in that seven-year period in terms of STEM graduates per capita. If we zoom in here onto this chart, we see the top 10. But if we want to go beyond the United Kingdom, we only need to increase this figure by roughly 12 percent, or 14,000 students per year. So very, very tight race here at the top. Now, the next couple of charts that I want to show you are one of Poland's superpowers and that's its women. Poland is also number four in terms of total STEM graduates, total female STEM graduates at 324,000. But look at this. It's number one on a per capita basis. And what's even more striking is if we look at the female to male ratio 
for STEM graduates, Poland's at 43%. It's almost half. Compare this to Norway or Finland, which are 28 and 27%. So we have not only a high density of highly skilled workers, but we get brownie points for great gender diversity. Next up, we're going to talk a little bit about the public funding situation in Poland. So there's two vehicles that provide funding to both startups and VCs. We have the National Center for Research and Development and PFR, specifically PFR Ventures. PFR is the Yasma of Poland. NCBR, since 2016, will have deployed four and a half billion dollars through its Fast Track and Bridge Alpha program. And PFR will have deployed 750 million dollars. If we're going to compare this with Yasma, that deployed 250 million dollars back in the early 90s. PFR alone will have deployed three times as much capital, but if we combine this with NCBR, it will have been 20 times more capital. Remember this chart? Let's zoom in on VC-backed startups. 1993 was the inflection point. Here's Poland. There's our inflection point. So Poland today is where Israel was in 1995. So we have our public capital to catalyze a reaction. I'm sure all of you may have heard, Google just recently announced a massive cloud development center here in the center of Warsaw, at least 14 floors, and is deploying roughly $2 billion into this project. And they're probably doing this because Microsoft just a year earlier announced that it was investing a $1 billion also into its Azure cloud platform here in Poland. And finally, Intel, yet again, is f and Poland is fighting for an $80 billion prize from Intel, and this is also in addition to the 3,300 employees that are in Gdańsk, in the north of the country. So we have our large investments into high-tech areas. Finally, back in 2014, 2015, with the political situation in Ukraine, roughly two to three million Ukrainians emigrated to Poland in a five-year span. This is one of the largest migrations in the history of Europe. And also, since 2000, as the economic situation is continuing to improve in Poland, more and more people want to move to Poland for economic opportunity. So we have our immigration picture. But now there's one last thing that I want to bring up that I haven't mentioned at all, it wasn't part of the five vectors, and it's Poland's other secret superpower that it has that no other country has in the entire world. And that's its diaspora. In the 20th century, many Poles left Poland because of the war and because of communism. Because of that, Poland has one of, if not the largest and most dispersed diaspora in the entire world. To put it into context, there's roughly 10 million people of direct Polish descent living in the United States, and 6 million living in Europe. That's 42% of today's population. Imagine if we were to repatriate 1.6 million of these individuals back to Poland. That's 4% of the population. These people would bring back soft skills that would complement a highly skilled workforce here in Poland. So, I go back to my original question. Does Poland have enough of these vectors to sustain and to build a big tech ecosystem? I think it does. But not only that, I also think Poland has an opportunity to not just become any old tech ecosystem, but one of the largest tech ecosystems in the world. And that's given the fact that we have the largest diaspora in the entire world. When the 800,000 Jews left the, left the Soviet Union back in the early 90s and came to Israel, that was the spark that initiated the Israeli tech ecosystem. Imagine if the same happened for Poland. So if you're out there right now and you're listening, and either you, your parents, or your grandparents left Poland many years ago, I want you to consider this as an invitation. An invitation to come back. An invitation 
to utilize your skills and apply them to a highly skilled workforce here in Poland. An invitation to come back and build the largest tech ecosystem the world has ever seen. Thank you very much.